Thank you very much, Paolo, for the invitation. Um, and I'm going to start with that invitation because I have to say that when I received all of the information about Mega Dungeon from Paolo, at first I thought, wow, you know, this is interesting. Um, a bit new for me. I'm not exactly a gamer, so it was a, a whole new universe. Um, but after reading a little bit, one of my first reactions was, uh oh, I think maybe I work in a mega dungeon. And perhaps some of you have had the same kind of experience. So that was my starting point. And you'll be thinking, OK, so where, where does she work? Well, I work for Colección Solo. Um, Colección Solo, eh, as, it as its name indicates, started life as an art collection. Um, we currently hold uh, almost a thousand artworks by 274 artists from across the world and across very, very diverse media from painting through to sound art, uh, a lot of drawings and a lot of digital artwork um, recently with a, a, a focus on, on people who are working with AI. Um, it's a shared collection that's very important for us. So you can visit us uh, physically, which is absolutely free. It's open to the public and it's also shared online. So we're one of the few uh, private collections that actually publish absolutely everything that we hold online. So you can see what we, what we have. Um, but actually I think uh, Solo goes very, very uh, far beyond accumulating. And that's a thing we'll be talking about today. So it's a collection based on supporting artists, and giving roots for a whole variety of creative projects. So, okay, so this is the simple version. Um, and here's the, the more complex version. So raising to the challenge, this provocative challenge of mapping projects as a mega dungeon, we played around and we came up with this map of what, what the solo experiment is. So this is a Colección Solo expressed as a mega dungeon created by our in-house graphic designer. And as you can see here, we have maybe this uh, central circle uh, named here Colección Solo. And then coming out from it, we have physical space, Espacio Solo. We have a future physical space, a CSB, which is gonna be a 4,000 meter uh, square space in Madrid opening uh, hopefully late next year. Um, we organize exhibitions inside Espacio Solo curated by ourselves. We also loan a whole load of works. So you'll see little offshoots there that refer to uh, loans and exhibitions outside uh, our own space. We worked last year, and I'll be talking about it more today, on a huge project with a public space in Madrid called Matadero. Um, you see an offshoot there called On Chaos. On Chaos uh, is a whole project we developed to support digital artists. So it works a little bit like a representative gallery incubator uh, for digital artists, connected at the same time as not connected to, to Solo. So you can see the way that we have developed, I think, can be expressed very, very well with your, your mega dungeon idea. And even uh, we're expressed on this, on this mega dungeon map up in the corner there, you can see collaborations with universities. So there we all are. Um, Solo works with around a dozen different universities at the moment, organizing things from, uh, uh, I don't know, students making curricular visits or us helping artists to give masterclasses at, at universities. So basically from two people's passion for art that started back in 2014 collecting, uh, those two people are Ana Gervas and uh, David Cantoya, David Cantoya, we've developed into this uh, bizarre kind of structure. So if I'm thinking not only about the structure, but these, uh, maybe the concepts that I can observe working inside this mega dungeon of Solo, I thought, well, I should bring a little bit of romanticism into the morning. So here we've got the archetype 
of the romantic wandering hero. Um, and I think that I find when I observe the way that uh, Solo collects, experiments and operates, a lot to do with the romantic notion of wandering, not from the nostalgic viewpoint, but from this obsession with the non-linear. We've been talking about that a lot this morning. So. In that respect, I find uh, Irving Babbitt's uh, quote very, very interesting. He tells us that the romantics didn't really like their railroad. One of their grievances against the railroad is that it does not encourage vagabondage. It has a definite goal and it gets to it so far as possible in a straight line. So I think the link that I want to make with wandering is really this rejection of the straight line. And that's something that I really find inside Colección Solo. Um, the obsession of the two people behind Solo is to experiment in every direction possible. Possible. Wandering, of course, takes us on to the idea of the flaneur. There's been an awful lot of literature, uh, academic literature over the past maybe eight, ten years about the connections between uh, flanery and, and what's happening digitally, where people are wandering and how they're wandering. So I've put there the, the, the drawing from uh, Louis Hart's uh, uh, writing on, on, on the flaneur, um, but he's gazing where, where are collectors, private collectors, where are they gazing now? Um, speaking with the people uh, behind Solo and specifically with, with the, uh, David Cantoya, he says to me, look, every day I'm looking on Artsy, I'm looking on Twitter, I'm looking on Instagram. So I think there is a case uh, still to be made for, for this digital uh, flannery uh, of wandering around in, in digital spaces and looking for, for artworks that provoke you and that, that uh, make, you, make you think. So a solo situationist, maybe, um, and that's why I've found it interesting to draw your attention to one work that we hold in the collection, that's Psychogeography by Dustin Yellen. He takes little cutouts uh, and creates these amazing uh, three-dimensional collages that turn into sculptures. Play, of course, is another factor that we have to talk about. So we're not only wandering in a non-linear direction or multi-direction, but we're playing around. So we've spoken this morning already about Omo Ludens. I should mention here that when we were organizing our exhibition a couple of years back, uh, Still Human, uh, when we were exploring the, the concept of play, um, David said to me, okay, Omo Ludens, that's us. That's our approach at Solo, to play around. Um, I think what we should understand with playing around here is the idea of world building, of breaking the rules um, and of twisting reality in a sense. That's something that Cassima Cueta does. Uh, she's an artist that's also held by our collection and I think is very relevant here. This is a still from her work, Angela's Flood. Um, she revisits video games um, from a feminist perspective and twist them around into something that she feel can uh, tell stories much more relevant of today. So check, check her out in the, in the context of play and world building. So an interesting thing for me is how this approach uh, is translated into a physical space at Solo. This is our uh, home in Madrid, Espacio Solo Madrid. And from the images here, you can see that it's a space that's absolutely labyrinth-like. It's designed by Juan Herreros. He's the architect behind the Munch Museum in Oslo, which has recently been opened. Um, and as you can see here, this idea of getting lost in an art space is absolutely expressed in our physical home. So every time you exit a door, you've got literally staircases and invitations to go one way or another. I wanted to share with you a little bit about Juan Herreros' uh, uh, creative process. Um, this is from a publication this year, Doma Architecture Magazine. Um, and I think it's quite nice that he expresses on the, on the cover uh, the layout of Solo as a kind of a block, a building block. 
Herreros uh, is very interested in not open spaces, but sequences of experiences. So you can see in the central panel that he conceives first experiences or spatial experiences, and then puts them together in a kind of a storyline or adventure. So those experiences or blocks merge together and we end up with the, the overall architectural plan of our, of our space. So speaking with Juan Herreros, uh, he said to me, Rebecca, if you're talking about mega dungeons, you cannot not mention Cedric Price's Fun Palace. Um, I'm sure you'll be aware of this uh, project for a building. This is maybe the example uh, of, a, of a mega dungeon. And well before his time, Cedric Price was already imagining huge screens, um, tiny lifts where even the, the weather would change when we were inside them. So really he had an immersive and multimedia experience in mind um, back in the late 50s. Uh, reading about Price, uh, I was very much inspired by um, Royston Landau's vision of Price's work as a philosophy of enabling. And I think that's really what solo uh, is about too. I think we're looking at the mega dungeon as um, an environment, an enabling an environment, an environment where things can happen. No? So that takes us with the collection uh, to a new vocabulary, I think, um, a vocabulary that goes beyond uh, what we think of as a private art collection, uh, maybe a post-accumulative vocabulary that is not collecting, but experimenting and not exhibiting, but sharing and enabling, uh, allowing things to happen, inviting things to happen. So what are those things that we enable to happen? I can't talk about all of them today, but I'd like to step another layer down in our solo experience and talk to you about one exhibition and one group of artists that we, that we have worked with. Both of these adventures have the same starting point. That starting point is this work, uh, Paradise, from 2016 by uh, the arts trio Smack. So as you probably see, uh, this work is inspired by the Garden of Earthly Delights by Hieronymus Bosch. And this work was actually commissioned by the Stedelijk Museum uh, back in 2016 uh, for the 500th anniversary of, of Bosch's death. So what happened? Um, Anna and David acquired this work. They fell in love with it. They acquired this work. And from this work, two uh, adventures started, two of these non-linear adventures in, in the solo mega dungeon. Um, the first adventure was to uh, start supporting this trio of artists. And we commissioned them to complete the digital triptych, which they did, turning paradise over a three-year period into speculum. Um, so this is the installation view at Matadero Madrid from our exhibition last year. Um, and that exhibition uh, really grew out of the relationship with, with Paradise. So not only did Solo uh, commission the digital triptych from SMAC, but Solo started to think about the idea of, okay, let's speak to others among our artists because we reckon they'll, they're gonna be interested in, in Bosch too. And let's see what they can come up with. So over a period from 2016, a five year period, we commissioned and acquired contemporary artworks inspired by the Garden of Earthly Delights. Um, these range from Microcosm, which is uh, an, an earlier work than, than many of those that we included. This is by Miao Xiaochun. He's a pioneer, as you might know, of uh, digital art, uh, digital animation. Uh, he's based in Beijing. Um, but not only digital works, we um, commissioned sound art, there were drawings, uh, uh, paintings, acrylics, and even ceramics. You can see there El Jardín de las Delicias by Lucecita. She's a Spanish artist, a ceramicist. And of course, there has to be 
uh, mega dungeon in, in our selection of works inspired by the Garden of Earthly Delights. This is Goed by Dan Hernandez. Um, the gamers among you will love this artist, so check him out. And you can see his, his vision of uh, Bosch's masterpiece. Um, is a huge map based on the Legend of Zelda and a work that really talks about the, the possibility or not of free will translated to, to RPG, to open world gaming. So all of these works, uh, we didn't have in mind an exhibition. Um, it was an adventure, one of these non-linear adventures that started, but the opportunity arose for us to work with Madrid City Council and with Matadero, huge public space, to put them together in an exhibition. And I'd like to share with you how we went about that exhibition. I think it's relevant here. We were very much inspired by the idea of Bosch's work, 500 year old work, as an interactive experience, uh, as an experience of exploring in itself. So you'll remember that the work is actually a box with this uh, image on the outside of the creation, but then you open it. And we know in fact that uh, Henry of Nassau used to invite round his mates to have a beer. And then when everyone was feeling quite happy, open this work out and show people the spectacular world inside. And really this is a non-linear world. This, it can be read as this simple story of sin, but we preferred to see it maybe as a kind of a mega dungeon. It's, it's a world that you say, okay, I can zoom in on so many different stories and experiences here. And that was the, the experience that we wanted to bring and express through, through the, the exhibition. So the exhibition physically, uh, again, we worked with Estudio Herreros. We created a kind of labyrinth, uh, as you can see here. It was a labyrinth made of cardboard. So we also wanted for environmental reasons and uh, for the contrast with the digital content, we wanted to work with cardboard, uh, creating this kind of labyrinth, which as you can see on the plans then brought you to this huge space where speculum was shown on 21 meter screen. So um, there was this element of surprise when you got to the end of the labyrinth. Here's a little bit of how it looks. So this is the invitation to uh, explore inside the garden, quite a small door, a uh, very big building with this little tiny door that you have to get into on, on this uh, adventure of, of our Garden of Delights. And this is how it looked inside. So really inviting you down these corridors to, to discover the artworks. We also wanted to bring this spirit of exploration and adventure into the publication that we developed for uh, for the garden. And here you have a, a picture of the, the cover and back cover of the, the exhibition catalog. As you can see, we've made this uh, crisscrossed uh, screens to, to represent the digitalization in a sense of, of Bosch's work. Um, here you see how it works on the page. And I really wanted to draw your attention to the contents page, because again, we're talking about everything being non-linear. Um, when putting together this book and writing this book, I felt really clearly that it had to be a non-linear kind of a book, a book that you could open the contents page and say, look, I'm interested in surrealism and I can go straight there. So I was really happy with the graphic design for this uh, developed by uh, Susana Pozo. She used the original uh, Bosch image as a starting point for the contents page. So instead of the typical tedious contents page, this is the page that invites you to explore physically the, the book. So we've talked about uh, Colección Solo. We've dropped down to another layer of the garden. And then I'd like to talk to you about SMAC, about how we support different artists. Uh, SMAC are those guys that started with Paradise. Uh, they did plenty of things before that, but for, for Solo, we, we learned about them through Paradise. Um, and how has our Mega Dungeon approach uh, impacted on their creativity? Well, first of all, uh, we can talk about visibility, I suppose. So um, Speculum uh, 
at Matadero Madrid was seen by over 92,000 people. So we're very, very happy with how this approach to the Garden of Earthly Delights connected with the public and particularly a very young public that might not normally uh, go off to visit uh, contemporary works inspired by, by a Renaissance work. We've also uh, helped SMAC to show the work in different places in historical at Phillips, uh, very interestingly, at Colnaghi Gallery London, those of you that are familiar with the art world will know that this is a gallery uh, dedicated to old masters, a very old school gallery. So for them to include this kind of digital work is, is quite uh, exciting. But visibility is only one step. A thing that I'm interested in sharing with you is in how Solo helps artists to explore uh, down different routes that they fancy taking too. So when they finished Speculum, um, Smack were very interested in uh, using game engines uh, in their works. They wanted to create gener generative works or live works, not only uh, what they call a linear digital animation, such as uh, Speculum. So this is their most recent, recent project, Tribe. Tribe is basically a population of characters and those characters are deployed in different scenarios. So one of those scenarios is Tribe City, a live work talking about mass behavior. These different characters move around, worship the totem that you can see at the center. The second work is Tribe War. Um, and Tribe War, again, is a live work. It's a work in which these different tribes wander around in a space um, and then suddenly start fighting with each other um, until one group is the winner. We can see here on the series of uh, screenshots that the, the white group have, have won here. Um, they celebrate, they wander off, and then everything starts over again. But as I said, this is a live work so that we never know as a, as a viewer where it's gonna go, um, which group is gonna win out uh, in this contest. And uh, Tribe Tower, it's a mixture of a Tower of Babylon and a Panopticon. This is a, a work that's on show right now in uh, Eindhoven in the new Evoluon building. Um, and again, this is a tower that just grows and grows and grows and grows. The people are circling inside it, imagining that they're arriving at paradise, but not, not actually getting anywhere. So this is one way in which we've really worked with SMAC. Um, Solo has impacted, I would say, on their artistic decision making in the sense that they were really excited about working with uh, game engines and thanks to support from the the collection they they could go down that that particular rabbit hole another rabbit hole for them was working visual uh, physical media so these are digital artists and uh, we've worked with them to bring their digital works to physical format. So here you can see King uh, on the right hand side, that's a uh, King in bronze uh, version. And on the left hand side, King in the tribe golden circle. I find this really interesting. We've been talking a little bit about the crossover between physical and, and digital realities this morning. Smack uh, said to me just the other week that when they saw the final version of King in bronze uh, cast for them by a foundry based on their designs and so on, it really made them think again about the scale of their digital works. It made them think, oh my God, I'm looking at this work on a little screen, maybe. And maybe I'm even looking at it on my phone, a, a trailer of the work but the physical work gives me a completely different sense of scale. So I think this is another thing that's interesting with the way that Solo is working with these artists, supporting them to develop paths that they might not have uh, considered before. So I've been talking about Solo and how our work impacts on artistic decision-making, but I, I think it's useful for me to just share with you where can you find more information about what private collections are doing and which ones are the ones that you should look out for. Um, there are lots of sources of information, but the key ones are, are probably these. So the Bible for checking out 
uh, which are the top collectors is probably Art News's top 200 collectors uh, published every year. And actually the 2022 edition comes out today. So if you really fancy seeing who's the top 200, you can, you can find out today. Um, there's also a guide called the BMW Art Guide. And this guide shows you the private collections that have museums open for the public to visit. So I think the private collection arena is maybe one that we can feel is a little bit, uh, has barriers to it. There may be mega, mega dungeons that are not too inviting, um, but actually in this guide, you'll find the ones you can visit. And then Larry's List. Larry's List uh, based in Hong Kong uh, is another good resource to find collections. I wanted to mention very speedily, I hope Carolina won't mind, just two uh, that are quite different to Solo, but I think could give us some perspective too. The Kramlik collection is one of the major collections of digital art in the world. Um, started back in 1982 um, by Pamela and Richard Kramlik. And I think the interesting thing about uh, Kramlik, uh, looking at why they collect and what kind of thing they collect compared to the uh, multi-linear approach of Solo, is that they really look at when they started, what was new? They come from Silicon Valley, they come from California, their background was in technology. And they said, wow, we really wanted to collect the things that people were making with this new palette, this new paint of digitalness. So I find it interesting that the geographical location of that couple impacted on what they decided to collect. Um, again, they talk about collecting works that keep them thinking and growing. So maybe uh, there's a little bit of difference there in that they're not chasing only newness, but they're chasing things that make them look and look again. Physical experience is really, really important for, um, for Pamela and, and uh, Richard Kramlik. They always uh, visit physically the installations and artworks. Um, they tend not to, to purchase or acquire works simply by what they've seen online. And that I think is really interesting nowadays. And then finally, their institutional collaborations. The Kramlik from the outset have worked with major institutions on uh, digital conservation, for example. So they've really looked from the beginning to develop links with, uh, for example, MoMA, MoMA San Francisco uh, and the Tate. Uh, the second mini case that I'd like to mention to you is DSL collection. Again, they are very, very different to, to Solo in the sense that uh, Dominique and Sylvie, DSL is Dominique and Sylvie Levy. They're based in Paris, um, but they collect Chinese art. So they impose a couple of limitations on themselves. One is that they are completely focused on Chinese contemporary art. Um, and secondly, that they limit the number of works in their collection to 350. So maybe they're a mega dungeon too, but uh, one with limits. So um, they rotate the works and always keep this three, 350 work limit. They're very dedicated to openness, to sharing the collection. Um, you can get the whole catalog of their collection online. It's free to download. And they're very, very engaged and always have been with new technologies. So the DSL Collection Virtual Museum back in 2016 was one of the pioneering uh, virtual museums um, and still is. Uh, they're very active in looking for ways to bring gaming and the metaverse uh, into art conversations. And in fact, they see museums as places for an exchange of ideas. So certainly those enabling mega dungeons where things can happen, uh, that, that has to do with, with DSL. So to conclude, uh, I've brought you back to, to Solo's mega dungeon. Um, of course, we have a wonderful conceptual tool here to help us think about what it is that we're doing. And actually I have to, I have to thank you guys for, for proposing this provocative kind of a theme because it's actually five years since we opened our physical space in Madrid. And, and preparing for today has really made us think about what we do, the way in which we, we do it and how we can 
uh, map and and tell a story of what what solo is is all about. So um, certainly the mega dungeon, I think, has a long way to go conceptually to map all kinds of, of different projects and, and ours is one of them. Um, thinking about the future, there's one final thing that I that I find very interesting. If we have collectors who are digital flaneurs who wander around space uh, and uh, discover new things, I think we have to ask um, important questions about what's drawing or attracting their attention and why. If we're in an era of echo chambers and recommendation algorithms, I can't seriously believe that I am a flaneur without limits. So I think it would be really interesting to look deeper into how uh, the way those recommendation al algorithms work, the way um, online recommendations work is impacting on curating, on collecting, on, on the art world. Larry's List already started doing that with one report on Instagram impact this year, but I think it's a, an interesting thing for us to look at. So yes, we're a mega dungeon, but if we want to keep that mega dungeon open, growing, non-linear, then we have to make sure that we're not having limits set by, by those online environments where we're searching out new things. Um, I think that's all from me. Thank you very much. Thank you.